All right, guys, let's get that sound check done. I know my intro. I know my intro music you could hear because I could hear it. Let's see how this microphone's doing. Just need a couple people to say yeah. Thank you, Vicky. That was fast. All right, that's good. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> All right. We already got a thousand people in the chat, so get my little announcements out of the way and we'll go ahead and get started. Hi guys, I can't do a shout out. There's just too many of you that I personally know now. Too many people I've exchanged messages with. So many of you I've actually met multiple times at meetups in my travels. Some of you right here in, in uh, Houston area. I just can't, I can't do the shout outs. It, it's going to get really distracting. But I will shout out to my moderators. Real quick, I do want to make this announcement. Uh, Shiva Shampoo. I don't know if he's in the chat right now, but Shiva Shampoo was sent the book. Remember, when I have extra copies of books in my library back here, or if I come across unique documents that I don't need to maintain possession of because I have other copies, uh, originals. Uh, I have I have original of the of the uh, Wait Charles Wait book, the first two hundred years of the Christian religion, which I've promoted heavily on my channel, for especially the Christians who really don't understand how the New Testament was put together. So, uh, Shiva Shampoo is one of my my longest moderators, and that book was mailed to him, and uh, I believe it's in the South Pacific. But uh, I come across two more, and I can't. I can't hold on to these. I have promoted David Davidson, engineer, 1926, and H. Alder Smith, who wrote who wrote this book. My copy is right here. Here it is, The Great Pyramid. It's divine message. David Davidson and H. Alder Smith. I have a copy from the from 1926, but my publisher had these two. Somebody, somebody had printed up. It looks better than the original because they had increased the size of the charts and the graphs. It is hundreds of illustrations. This is showing you that the Great Pyramid is prophecy in stone, that it is a calendar. It is also giving many, many, many secrets. It's giving many secrets to all kinds of calendrical things. Phoenix cycles, the Phoenix history. It's in here, guys. David Davidson is the one that I show the il illustrations for where he measured the base diagonals of the Great Pyramid's geometric features and determined that the Great Pyramid encodes a timeline concerning our world as a construct and that that timeline will be fundamentally uh, uh, changed in 2046. I showed it out of here, guys. Totally independent research from Nemesis X, from the Sodom and Gomorrah palindromes, so, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, uh, cross clinical parallels, absolutely independent research from Douglas Vogt's 2046 prediction. This is astonishing. The reason I'm showing it is because I went my last trip to the book tree in San Diego. Having seen these, I couldn't just let them fall into anybody's hands. This material like this has to be really appreciated. So they were $75 a piece, and uh, I bought both of them. And I'm going to be giving them away for free, one to a member of Archaics, somebody who is a monthly member to Archaics. I will be putting it in the members chat. Somebody's going to get this book for free. The other person who's going to get this book for free is going to be one of my moderators. So I'll be getting, getting with them later, figuring this out, because over the course of months, as I come across, I have a lot more material. Uh, I have classics. I do not collect fiction. However, this what you see behind me is all nonfiction research, chronographical material, history, anthropology, archaeology, astronomy, all everything in here. Most of it, all, especially my 1700s and early 1800s, is almost all chronology. But this is a nonfiction library. All the shelves back here, are all filled filled behind my computer, are all filled up with nonfiction. But I have a storage, and in my storage, I have bins absolutely packed full of nonfiction classics. I do not collect these, but I, but I kind of did 
inadvertently. I have original Charles Dickens. I have original fiction books, Jules Verne. I have a lot of stuff from the 1800s and uh, all the way up to about 1920. I'm going to be giving these away for free also to Archaics members, to members of Archaics uh, 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 Archaics TV, and also especially my moderators. My moderators come first, but I only have a few of them. So uh, there's no reason for me to hold on to these treasures and these classics. Some of them are worth a fortune. I don't care about the worth. What I care is about they fall into the hands of those who are going to deeply appreciate them. Uh, I do not appreciate fiction. Therefore, I have no business holding on to it. So anyway, uh, I'll be getting with I'll be getting with the moderators and the uh, uh, in the members chat and uh, Archaics TV about the distribution of a lot of these a lot of these books and texts. So, <clears throat> yeah, so many people. I mean, I've spent a fortune. Don't get me wrong, guys. I have spent a personal fortune on books in this library. Some of these books were thousands of dollars a piece, and I've showed you guys when I made these these purchases. But it doesn't matter. More than fifty percent of the books you see in this, and the ones you can't see, my my, my shelves stretched that way. All these books, more than fifty percent of them were donated by you guys. So freely I have received, freely I'm going to give. It's as simple as that. Just need to show some appreciation. The name the name of that book is The Great Pyramid by David Davidson and H. Alder Smith. It's divine message. Uh, on the Houston, on the latest Houston meetup, we did a roundtable with Martin Leakey, and 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 uh, Campbell of Autodidactic. We got in a circle, and the community came and got in a circle. And this is where we come up with the idea of roundtables. It wasn't a roundtable for just the speakers; it was a roundtable for all participants. Everybody came in, got in a circle. We had double row of chairs, and uh, during that, we raffled off bags. And people went up there and they were really surprised. They opened those they opened those bags up and they found classics from the 1800s. You know, this is what this is what I did. You know, I'm going to continue to do so because my my collection is huge. You know, like I said, there's no reason for me to hold on to it. Now, <clears throat> oh, all right, we got over 1,400 people in the chat. There's no there's no reason to to delay this anymore. Uh, the subject matter is Cliff High. Uh, I don't know him personally. I've never communicated with the man. This is not a vendetta. Uh, this is really not an expose either. Uh, this is only a critique of a single video, his latest podcast, and it was with Conspiracy Analytica. I am not trying to promote Conspiracy Analytica. I am not impressed with him at all. As an interviewer, I would expect him to have been a lot more knowledgeable on the subject matter. He is not, and it is very apparent. You know, I'm not I'm not impressed with Conspiracy Analytica. Uh, Jordan Sather, uh, he's not on my radar. He's not going to be on my radar. He's not anyone I'm I'm even interested in talking to. So, uh, we're gonna get we're gonna get into this because by the end of this video, this is 100% up to the public to determine fact from fiction. It's up to you guys. I'm not gonna try and tell you, tell you, and force my opinion on you. You decide for yourself. Is somebody just elucidating via a lack of knowledge? They just don't know and, and they think they do? Or is somebody being deliberately deceitful? Now, in the case of Cliff High, I actually think he's not near as researched in historical and chronological matters as he pretends himself to be. This doesn't make him a bad fellow. In fact, it has nothing to do with any spiritual material he may have out there. I don't know. I don't listen to him. But I've got over a dozen emails in the past year and a half asking me, what do you think about Cliff High? I don't know. So I took the time out of my life to listen to a Cliff High video. And it was the Conspiracy Analytica video where they covered a whole multiplicity of topics. Did I hear anything spiritual out the man? No, but I heard some people tell me that he does have spiritual stuff. And uh, I don't want to step on that. He may be a really good guy. I don't know. But when it comes to anachronisms, chronographical material, you guys know I am not going to step aside and be silent. So we're going to get through these. We're going to get through this conspiracy analytica podcast together. Just the relevant. I have 24 sound bites that I have isolated. You're going to listen to them with me. And then I'm going to tell you the business. So 
Uh, I will say, I will say this. I promise that this is probably the most polite and cordial, respectful analysis that I will ever do against another podcast channel, a host, a YouTube channel, uh, uh, any public figure. Yeah. If I decide to isolate somebody from here on out, I don't really put Cliff High in that category because he seems like he's trying to educate the people. He seems like his heart's in the right place. Uh, but this is entirely up for you to decide. How somebody perceives the world that they're living in has everything to do with the output that comes out of their soul. Do they really believe what they're saying? If they if they do, then that means they actually believe in the in the paradigm that they've accepted. But if somebody doesn't quite believe that the world that they're living in is the world that the establishment has conveyed it to be, it will be very noticeable in the things that they try to teach others. There will be disparities. There will be incongruencies that you'll be able to pick up on. You guys know pattern recognition as a chronologist is one of my specialties. And this is what I've brought to the table in many, many presentations. What you don't know, unless you specifically look recently, is that there is a whole list of videos and the links to go to those videos in the description box right now. Because these videos are all going to be mentioned in this presentation. Because had Cliff High of known of this data, these tremendous data sets that were available, he would have never said some of the things he said in this video. So we're going to get to it. In the description box are all our, our links to about a dozen archaic videos that give you the business. I don't need to convince you of anything. You are basically an intelligent individual, and a discerning individual can easily see a data set and make up their own mind. Simple as that. I don't need to tell you anything. If you're willing to, if you're willing to listen and look at the data, then it's real easy to see when someone is right or wrong. This, this isn't about ego. This isn't about per, a personal attack. I'm not personally attacking anyone. Archaics 2024, at least in this series, Archaics Iconoclast, I, I, this is a call to arms. I am going to war against false information in the truther community. I am not going to war against personalities. We need to make that distinction. All right, so you guys know. Let's see, we got sixteen hundred people in the chat. More than enough to start. More than enough to start. Let's go ahead and present. I, think I didn't really have much of announcements. I have a lot of thank you cards. We have new archaics appreciation. Thank you for donation cards that are pretty cool. We got some information on them. Oh, uh, we're sending those out for the first time this week. Uh, uh, trying to go back and remember a lot of people who have donated books, donated T-shirts. Like this is a donated T-shirts freight train. I did say last month that I'm going to start. I'm going to come into 2024 like a freight train. So they sent me the shirt. We'll, we'll be sending all those those out this week. A bunch of cards, and you know we were on a, on, on a vacation, so so all those all those books, T-shirts, thumb drives, uh, all the archaics decals and stickers and hats, uh, tote bags, all that stuff's being mailed out this week. So, uh, I'm not into the name calling. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to entertain that. Uh, like I said, if if a man if a man has hundreds of videos on YouTube and other platforms, then I can't really develop an opinion about that individual. So this is not personal. What I can do is go right through this video that I'm about to show you. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. To these uh video files here. I believe I'm going to go ahead. And show this one. Recently, I started digging into true human history, comparing how many ancient texts and mythologies, such as Greek and Norse mythology, Sumerian texts, biblical scriptures, and others, are all basically saying the same thing. You have to work past the fantasy, allegory, and possible misdirection, but it's fascinating how each essentially described the colonization of our planet by a spacefaring extraterrestrial species looking to create a human slave race and farm the planet. They are the Anunnaki, Aesir, or Elohim as they're called, depending on what culture you're reading from. These extraterrestrials are referred to in many of our ancient texts as the gods. Interesting if, after all these centuries, we were worshipping our own overlords. I mean, that's how a demonic group of malevolent ETs would set things up, right? So, let me know 
This is the first time I tried this type of presentation. I normally just share my screen. Let me know if you heard that clip. Hey, Shiva, I just saw you there. I see somebody saying blah. I just need to know if y'all heard that clip. I'm, I'm using the software correctly. You guys know. I may be book smart, but I'm tech retarded. Sounds cool. Yes, thank you. Loud and clear. Awesome. Okay, so instantly, from the that's the first of 24 clips. Instantly, I am unimpressed with Jordan Sather or Slather, whatever, whatever his name was. I don't even care. I don't even care. I heard enough. I heard enough of his opinions in this video to realize that when it comes to history and chronology, he's probably one of the most most uneducated uh, podcast interviewers in in basically the Netscape. Uh, I am I'm absolutely unimpressed with this man. Uh, I don't know anything about his history. I don't know where he comes from, but uh, he's 100% pure Sitchinite and. You, are, you guys already know my position on that. You already know you've already, most of my archaics veterans have already seen all the data sets on that, showing all the all the errors of Zechariah Sitchin. This whole gotten all the way out of control on this. On this, uh, this is it's just out of, out of control on, on all that crap there. I don't even want to talk about. It. Let me uh, clear my screen. We're, we're about to get it. My Martin Leakey, as he says, we're going to get into the juicy juicy here in a second. All right, so I eliminate that, eliminate that. Oh, I love the system. Martin Leakey, thank you for teaching me how to use this system. I love it. I love it. Their intent as humans was to develop civilizations and stay there. I don't think that the Elohim had that intent. I think that they knew, uh, or I think it was strategic. I think they were are very well aware of the Kali Yuga and the diminution of mental energies uh, within humans during that period of time. And I think they came down here to sort of harvest us over a period of time, and they had no intention of staying forever, right? I, I disagree with people, um, you know, like Jay Widener, who thinks that they've been here, or Tucker Carlson says they've been here all along, and that sort of thing. Yes, I'm certain they've been here for the last 12,000 years. Okay. First of all, Jor Jordan, the interviewer, he needs to listen to the Archaics of Nuna Files playlist. Jordan, if you're listening, you need to educate yourself because you are, uh, yeah, you're in a world of hurt when it comes to understanding how the ancient world truly unfolded. But you need to listen to the Anuna Files playlist to get an understanding of who the Anuna were and how they were turned into the Anunnaki only in a name change, not an actual reality. So you have two different you have two different ancient sets of knowledge that were conveying histories about the same group of people. One of them was the Sumerian texts and traditions, and the other one was the later Babylonian Babylonian version that were written by a priest class called the Edomu, who later became the tiny hats that we know of today. So two two different sets of people, guys. Zechariah Sitchin too was one of these people. Anybody knows the history of Zechariah Sitchin, you know his ethnicity, you know, you know what he promoted. Now, the Elohim is merely an attempt to distance away from the Anunnaki narrative. Now, Cliff High is a smart guy. Now, I would never claim otherwise. He's a smart guy. So by him calling these gods Elohim. It attaches them to the Jewish people, but it also attaches the concept of, of these gods to the Old Testament, the Bible. But it's also a way to distance himself away from the, the Anunnaki narratives, which might, which might, you know, I don't think, I don't really know of, I don't remember him ever saying Anunnaki anywhere in this podcast. So I don't know if he was, he's addressed that in other, other deals, but there's no distinction. There's only there's only a distinction in in the basically the eponym, the name that has been attributed to these gods. So we're talking about the exact same thing here. So essentially, what I'm what I'm seeing here is Zechariah Sitchin just repackage. So the harvesting of humans is pure fear programming, just like the Matrix movies using humans as a battery. I've seen no evidence of this anywhere. There are no historical texts. There are no legends, traditions. There's nothing. This is entirely a new concept. It is brand new concept. 
It is a Hollywood-induced concept. I challenge everyone to find one single book that even refers to such a thing prior to the creation of Hollywood. Yeah, never, yeah, using humans as batteries or harvesting and eating humans, oh, God's coming, I just don't, I don't see it. I don't see it at all. But what alarmed me about this this one passage was Cliff High referring to a 12,000 year period. This is a red flag for me. Because this same 12,000 years is promoted. You're going to see. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to reveal, reveal my hand yet. I'm going to let you guys listen to it. But this 12,000 years is not just promoted by Cliff High. Cliff High just got it from somebody else. But it's promoted by a lot of people from diverse backgrounds. And it's attached to a very sinister agenda. Yeah, it's 12,000 12, years ago, according to Cliff High, the Elohim appeared. And they appeared to enslave humanity and then use humanity as food. This is what Cliff High is promoting in this podcast. So let's see. Let's see what we'll see with this third. Let's go see what this third. Uh, um, Cliff's going to say. These civilizations lasted for many thousands of years. This one in particular, we have a continuous record of them building the houses for 1,100 years the same damn way. Okay, so that civilization was in effect then. And then the Elohim come, and we have war and pillage and all of this kind of stuff. So uh, it is the nature of humans that, that, okay, so I'm of the opinion that the Elohim came here for their own purposes and perhaps want to farm us and do things like that, and they may still yet be here, but there was a vast number of centuries, millennia, that there were no aliens here. So they've not always been here. The Harappa Valley civilization in, in northern India has no icono, iconographic images, okay? That's something that you find everywhere where the Elohim are. The Harappan Egyptian Valley, hieroglyphics, the correct, yeah, Mayan Malaysian, writings, all Hindu, the stone images, yeah. Yeah, Mayans, exactly, right, right. The, the Elohim were seriously into that. clear this field real quick so you heard you basically heard that cliff where cliff, cliff is aware of a, of a civilization in india that built houses for 11 centuries and they weren't those houses were never changed i don't know where this data comes from but the civilization was abruptly interrupted by the appearance of the Elohim, which he said was twenty was 12,000 years ago. Here we have an archaeological and anthropological anachronism because there are no an anthropologists and there are no archaeologists, and myself included, who have ever found any evidence of any civilization in this world at 12,000 12, years ago. None. Isn't a hint of it. Civilization, or it literally exploded onto the scene in the 35th century BC. I have a whole video about that. Links in the description box. But yeah, this is an ad, this is this is a mystical version of the history for which there is no shred of evidence for. And I'm going to tell you how they got that. Uh, but anyway, in this one clip, Cliff, if you were paying attention. He now bridged, he already said Elohim, which, which makes us think of Old Testament, Bible. He already said the Elohim appeared 12,000 years ago. They interrupted civilization. Now, civilization was at peace when they appeared. So, he now crosses the bridge, bridging Elohim to extraterrestrials. That's what he said. So, now... We have a definition. When he says Elohim, he's talking about ancient aliens. Don't make no mistake. This is promoting the ancient aliens franchise. The whole the whole paradigm of ancient aliens is supported here by Cliff High. So no matter what you call it, no matter surreptitiously, it doesn't matter how you mask a thing. If that thing still walks the same way, it is, it is what it is. This is ancient aliens promotion. So, uh. I have I have to also correct Mr. High on his inaccurate 
information about there is no iconography there's no images no statuary no 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 symbols and signs for the indus valley civilization called harappan culture capital city was mohenjo daro at harappa and mohenjo daro and its outlying towns they found thousands of artifacts i don't know why cliff said that but it's easily verifiable by anybody so uh you know what Let's just go ahead and share my screen. Go ahead and share my screen real quick. I'm going to present share screen. All right. So I'm going to go here. Entire screen. Here. Share. All right. I'm sharing my entire screen so you guys can see Harappa. Let's go ahead. This, now, like I said, this doesn't make him a bad man, but it does make him absolutely wrong. We're going to go through these pretty quick. Anybody can verify it for yourselves. Look at that picture right there. Excavated from Mohenjo-Daro, Indus Valley, Harappan Civilization. Here's another one right here. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Every bit of this can be verified by you. A simple Google search of Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, Larek, Indus Valley. Harappan civilization, proto-India, proto-Pakistan. It's all here. It's a lot of them, guys. It's a lot of them. Every bit of this. Many of these symbols are very, very similar to Sumerian logographic. Look at that. The horned gods everywhere in the Near East. Almost, identi almost identical to Elamite, Assyrian, and Urartrian art. It's all right here, guys. It's the god of the two horns. Look at this. What do you got here? This is everywhere in the Near East. It is not. It is not unique to Harappa or Mohenjo-Daro. This is very unique. Here you have either the goddess or a, or a god, a hero, wrestling two lions. How many times have you seen that? That's everywhere. Yeah, guys, here it is. Mohenjo-Daro. Harappa. So. I don't know how many of these images I got. I got a bunch of them. Some of now look, it's really interesting that that the Mohenjo Daro Harappa art almost looks pre-Celtic. All right, I'm almost done. Almost got to the end of the file. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go back because there it is again. There's the there's the hero wrestling two lions right there. Same thing you see with Gilgamesh, Amar Udaak. Same thing with Nimrod. Same thing with Marduk. Yeah, here it is. Look at all that. All this right here out of Harappan Valley. All this is Harappan Valley. Yeah, elephant. Look at that. 4,500 years ago, they got this weird megafauna creature. We don't have a creature like that. That's supposed to be like a, a young, uh, one of those, uh, uh, it's called Miocene horse. Got a horn on his, on his deal. It's like a Miocene horse. It's extinct. Got a horn right there above its uh, nostrils on wheels. Look at that, wheels. Who invented the wheel? Looks like the Harappans did. That's the end of that file. That's the end of that file. Okay. Let me get back out of there. I'm still, still, stop the screen. All right. Make sure y'all, you guys saw that. Cool. I see, I can see any drawn wheels. Cool. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, like I said, it doesn't make him a bad fellow. It just makes him wrong. He does, he is absolutely wrong. Uh, that's a deity in between those two animals. That's exactly it's exactly how the Near Eastern scholars describe describe the uh, the hero god wrestling the two lions as well. Oh, uh, this is why Nimrod in the Book of Jasher and in the Midrashic text was called the mighty hunter before the Lord. 
He was he was an instrument of God. People don't realize this, but Marduk, Merodach, Amar Udaak, who later later was known by the Jews as Nimrod, and is recorded in Genesis as Nimrod, he began as holy. He he became unholy because something ha happened during his life. But uh, yeah, it's uh, so yeah, it's that's real. That was really interesting. Let's present. Let, let's uh. Let's move on. We don't need to. We don't need to beat that that Miocene horse in the mouth. All right. I need to present video file. I'm still getting used to the software, guys. So I think the Elohim came here. I'm of the opinion that they came here probably 12,000 years ago or thereabouts. I'm saying this because Gobekli Tepe and the other uh, uh, hidden. Um, statuary parks in, in Turkey area, which we will yet to discover because there's more. Mm -hmm. uh, those were deliberately buried. I think they were deliberately buried to uh, protect them from what the people knew was coming, which was the assault of the Elohim on this planet. Wow. Mark Higgs veterans already know, all, already know what I'm about to say. So Cliff Opines that the Elohim came 12,000 years ago because of the age of Gobekli Tepe. I'll probably never pronounce that right. And he claims that this site was deliberately buried. Now, I'm going to tell you now, that's not Cliff High's theory. He just got that from a YouTube video. This is what, this is what is widely promoted now. Although it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's almost comical that a people fearing fearing the coming of something would invest more man hours going to get the necessary dirt to bury their whole cityscape. Guys, it's not a small place. It's not. The archaeological site is vast. Its depth is vast. The amount of earth that would required to bury it is it's 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 almost incomprehensible. And yet What's not being told to you is that there's 22 other Tepe sites that were also equally buried. No civilization did this. This is a dumbass theory to try to cover up a phenomenon, part of the Phoenix phenomenon, that is referred to as mud floods, liquefaction. Yeah, that's ridiculous. I can't even believe anybody still believes this. Uh, uh, you, guys, you guys know I come from a contractor background. You know, my first two and a half years of this channel, I was busting my ass, Paradise Rock Gardens. I was building people's dreams in their backyards, flagstoning driveways, facades, all kinds. I'm going to tell you now, a one yard of dirt is a lot of dirt for one man to move. It's a lot. It's a lot. Can you imagine, can you imagine the hundreds of thousands of yards necessary just needed for one Tepe site? if not millions of yards necessary. Yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Uh, what's further ridiculous about it is that this theory is not based on any evidence at all. There's no traditions of burying these sites. There are no mythologies. There's no ancient texts that refer to this. And nor do we have any place in the historical record where a people fearing a cataclysm or fearing an invasion buried their city. We don't have anything like that. So it's a, it's, it's really it's really a suspension of disbelief to even entertain such a theory. It's, it's, it's idiocy. It's pure idiocy that anybody would promote that. It's just, uh, they have, they have little idea of how much work that would entail. You know, I just don't believe it. And it's not even just because of the work. It's because we don't have any antecedents. There is no precedent in history for doing such a thing, nor are there any text or traditions that, even support Cliff High's assertion that 12,000 years ago, a race from the stars appeared and people panicked and buried their cities. No, we don't, we don't even have anything. It's all conjecture. It's all, in, it's not even conjecture. It's all entirely invented. And these people, not Cliff High, put these inventions out in books and in videos. And then people like Cliff High 
come into contact with that data, accept it at face value without any further, further, further logically chasing the chasing just logical conclusion. Coming instead, they just accept it at face value, run run with it as fact, and then promote it. So, yeah, not getting the archaic stamp of approval on that at all. Now, for those of you who are interested in the description box and in the pinned comment at the end of this video, right now in the description box, you can click on to uh, my video, Gobekli Tepe, a 70-year-old lie becomes a 12,000-year-old truth. And you're going to see some pretty compelling material why Graham Hancock is absolutely wrong on, on his theories about this place. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, Cliff High, Cliff High has some educating to do before he goes to talking about all these and trying to mix and mishmash a whole bunch of uh, anachronistic, anachronistic material together to try to support an, a theory or an idea. So, uh, it is ridiculous too. Graham Hancock uses a scorpion effigy. There are hundreds of effigies in the Tepe sites, but he isolates a scorpion claiming that Scorpio and then turns around and tries to date the area at 8,500 BC. And it's all absolutely ridiculous. And I show that Easter Island, the effigies on Easter Island completely undermine. They take apart Graham Hancock's entire theory. Yeah. I also have another video, if anybody wants to watch it, called Tetra Biblos, if you want to see it, because Graham Hancock and many other archaeoastronomers are using the Zodiac to date many ancient sites to promote their alt version of history, which uses 12,000 BC as a date moniker. Listen, guys, it's all BS. It's all BS. The Zodiac is a late invention. The earlier Zodiac was only six signs, and that's what we find in the cuneiform. In the Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian, and Near Eastern texts, they had a Zodiac, but it was only six signs. The 12 sign Zodiac was introduced by the Greeks, and this is what the Egyptians admit. This is what the Vedic scholars admit, that the Indian Zodiac came from Greece. All this is in the data sets. You can go, you can go check out those videos. Don't let me convince you. Look at the data set yourself and the published books, the dates of the publication of the scholars, it's all there, guys. I didn't have to make anything up. All of not on board. Not on board with this with, with this with this little part here. Go check out Tetra Biblos and the Gobekli Tepe video, and you'll understand exactly what we're coming with. So I believe that was the fourth clip. Let's go to the fifth clip. All right. I'm going to remove that from studio. I'm going to present. I'm sorry I'm talking out loud. I just got to make sure I don't click on the wrong thing. And mess, and mess my video. Of the opinion that the Elohim caused um, Antarctica to become frozen, and that they did so by destroying this island that separates um, South America from Antarctica, which allowed a continuous stream of wind to form, which meant that the the entire global um, weather pattern was altered by the destruction of this one landmass. We see the remnants of the landmass yet today on these pictures of the bottom of the ocean at the tip of Antarctica. It's as though you took your thumb and smushed this island uh, out of the way. And thereafter, around the roaring 40s and 50s, we get this continuous circulating wind that causes the polar vortex to pull down very cold energies from space that froze Antarctica. Probably froze it fairly rapidly, like, you know, years, not hundreds of years because of the huge shift in, in temperature difference, and it used to be tropical, and we know this for a fact. Uh, so I'm of the opinion the Elohim did that, and they've done a lot of really nasty shit to us. Okay. You can't fault somebody for an opinion, so let's clarify. Cliff routinely says, I am of the opinion. This is a really safe way of conveying information. I'm not saying he's being deceitful. He may truly believe everything he's saying. But I can't, uh, I can't accuse him of lying when he's asserting this as opinion. So I have no problem dismantling this scenario as well. So I'm going to tell you now, guys, he's saying that Elohim 12,000 years ago caused Antarctica to be frozen. I don't care how he thinks it happened, eliminating an island that create that that completely altered the currents and trade winds that now froze. I don't care about that theory. I think it's absolutely untrue. But I'm going to bring something else to your attention. So 
Antarctica in Cliff High's model is at the bottom of the world. I believe I'm a simulationist. I believe we live in a realm. But in his model, he's still holding on to the globe model. That's fine. That's okay. In his model, the bottom of the world froze because an island at the bottom of the world was removed. What about the Arctic? What about the North Pole? What about all the two-mile-high ice cap in the northern circumpolar area? I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't understand how he accounts for that. Did they remove an island in the north as well? But even aside from all that, we have a real problem here because Mr. High is assuming that a shift in the wind would create two mile high ice caps and in, in, in snow for, you know drifts. And that's not true. You see, guys, there are 60 different published ice age theories. Not one. Ice age isn't even even a fact yet. It's still promoted as a theory. And today, to date. There are 60 different variants of the theory. The reason is, is because what Cliff High is not mentioning here, in order to create a two mile high ice cap and deal, it's not just freezing temperatures. You need humidity. If you don't have humidity, you can't create that ice and that snow. In the vapor canopy model that I have widely promoted on my channel, in which I have links to the scientific material testing and reports in, in the description box right now, I have a video called Vapor Canopy Mechanics. I have two videos about vapor canopy in the description box. You will learn that when the vapor canopy collapsed, an article was created not in not in tens of thousands of years and all that like the uniformitarians want you to believe it was created in hours when the vapor canopy collapsed toward the equatorial regions and the more temperate areas it fell as rain but in antarctica as it fell it turned to snow and it compacted everybody everybody in roofing knows that if you don't tilt your roof to a certain area to, to a certain pitch your whole roof will collapse just from the snow in Alaska and in Canada. Therefore, they have very steep, steep roofs. And then when you have snow un not stopping for weeks at a time, there's nothing that can take that pressure. So it gets crushed into, into layers of ice as more and more snow, snow comes. And it's there very rapidly once the vapor canopy has collapsed. In Cliff High's model, this happened 12,000 years ago, but we have Charles Hapgood's research. Professor Hapgood published several maps in Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings in the 1950s, where he shows the, the uh, Phineus map. He shows the Piri Reis map. These maps show Antarctica with no ice and snow, with mountain ranges and river valleys exactly where we see them in, in uh, uh, scientific uh, subsurface interface radar readings. Guys, this doesn't make sense. There's no way that these 15th, 16th, and 17th century maps are 12,000 years old. We have a problem here. So, uh, yeah, there's just no way. Now, um, yeah, further on, if you want to learn more about the Ice Age, how Ice Age has happened and all that, check out the video in the description box. Um, Ice Age Techniques. Vapor Canopy and How Graham Hancock Threatens Establishment Science. That video right there is going to educate you. So is Memories and Mechanics of a Vapor Canopy World. Both of those are in the description box and they will educate you about how fast a vapor canopy can form and how fast it can collapse and when it collapses, how it creates miles high ice and snow. It's very simple. It's very simple. No aliens came 12,000 years ago and, and nuked an island so it would change currents and winds so Antarctica could be. This is this is a this is a very uneducated idea. It's not even a theory. It doesn't qualify for a hypothesis. So 
It's all. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just leave that one alone. It's it's too much. It's just too much. Let's go to the next one. All right, remove that from studio. Present video file. Got a quick question. Do you think the Elohim got here before or after Atlantis and Lemuria? Okay, so Antarctica is Atlantis. Right. Elohim That's... destroyed Elohim destroyed Atlantis. My research it... has found Atlantis to be in Antarctic region, then extending up into South America, mm. up to where the Mayans kind of were. Right. You mean the whole empire? Sure. Right. Okay. Yeah. So Atlantis was the center. Of, it was the global hub of a human uh, civilization. Was right, so Atlantis I, I, the I, hub? Was yeah, Atlantis yeah, the I, hub or Meso Mesopotamia? No, Atlantis was the hub. Okay. okay. Ant Antarctica was the hub. You have to understand that if you had that island in place, Antarctica is not only... Um, uh, okay, so if you have that... Uh, okay, so here's... Whiteboard time. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's just say that that's basically sort of Antarctica, right? And here is uh, South America. If you had that island right there, you get a wind flow, a pattern that brings warm air down South America around this island, and it keeps Antarctica warm, right? But beyond that, it forms this flow that takes you right into the Atlantic. So you have this natural sailing ability to navigate all over the planet using Antarctica as basically your hub, your trading hub. So uh, I'm of the opinion that that Atlantis was Antarctica, and it was the hub of a global civilization that was destroyed by wiping this island out and causing these fierce winds that circulate there even today. Okay. Let me remove that from the studio. So, you guys know, I mean, there's not much I can say about this. My archaics veterans know, but I got new people on the channel, so I'm going to have to address it. First of all, the idea that Atlantis was Antarctica is not Cliff High's, and nor did he claim it was his, so uh, we can't lay that to his charge. Uh, I first came in contact with that theory in, in, in the writings of, of Rand Flemath. Now, I totally disagree with it, but I'm also aware that in the last 70 years, there's been 50 different locations for Atlantis all over the world, and Antarctica is only one, but Antarctica is absolutely in defiance of Plato's narrative. So if you're going to cherry pick Plato's narrative and decide and decide where Atlantis is in violation of the geographical confines that Plato described it to be, then basically you're, you, can, you can do anything you want with that narrative, such as claim that Atlantis was 12,000 years ago, which is an absolute defiance of the, the conditions that were set for the fall of Atlantis. Plato outlines them well. I have several videos about this where I show Graham Hancock is completely in error. He isolates one particular that was corrected over 200 times in, in the historical record, and Graham Hancock ignored every single one. Every one of them, guys, to date Atlantis at 9,600 BC. So, guys, it's not, it's not merely... You have to understand, my video was very serious. I did a, I did a live Q&A call out. It's in the description box right now. I did a live Q&A call out on all critics, anybody who wants to debate it, on Atlantis 9600 BC being a farce. I also did a video called A Total Dismantling of Hancock's 9600 BC Atlantis Dating. How can I be, how can I be so assured of myself? Is it bravado? Am I, am I just trying to gain subs? I do that anyway. What makes me so confident that I could call out a literary giant like Graham Hancock, who's been very, very quiet? Oh, yeah, he knows all about Jason of Archaics. He's been real, real quiet. You know why? I'll tell you why. 
because archaeologists have found out that the priests of Sais at Neith in Egypt did in fact date everything by moons, not years. Graham Hancock doesn't want to talk about that. You know what else Graham Hancock doesn't want to talk about? He doesn't want to talk about Eudoxus of Nidos corrected Plato that it wasn't 9,000 years before Solon that Atlantis was destroyed. It was 9,000 months. Eudoxus of Nidos understood how the Egyptians dated things. They dated it by months. They didn't care about the sun. The sun had they had lost favor. The sun, the sun had already been shown, according to Herodotus, the sun, the sun had already been shown to play false four times, meaning it deviated from its path. It stopped in the sky. It went in retrograde. It even rose, it, the sun even rose where it normally sets. And to the Egyptians, this meant it was dishonest and it could not be used as something to measure something as important as time. Herodotus records four times the Egyptians claim that the sun transgressed. So they so they dated things by the moon. Was it just it was it just the priests of Sais? Was it just Eudoxus of Nidos who said this? No. Diodorus, Siculus, Lactantius, Plutarch, Macrobius, they all said the same thing. And Manatho's 9,000 years was corrected by Julius Africanus as 9,000 months. Jason didn't make any of this up, and Graham Hancock knows this. Thomas Bratterween, look him up. Around 1340 AD, the man said that it was 9,000 months. Months, not years. Pierre de Alli, Pedro Sarmiento Galboa, all of them knew that Plato's description of Atlantis is accurate except for the mistranslation of years from moons. Everything else is right. Augustine Zarate, Eugenius Philolethes. Read these books, guys. That's 1721. I have a video, I have a video citing his book. I read whole passages out of his book on my channel. Guys, it's not Jason making this up. And this is why Graham Hancock will never debate about the age of Atlantis with Jason of Archaics. He would be a damned fool because he would, he would lose credibility with his followers. All these people that support him, like Cliff High, who obviously follows Graham Hancock. I've seen a lot of Graham Hancock in Cliff High's material. Just in this, just things he was saying in this one video. So I see what his influence is. So if you're if you're interested in these things, the, the links are in the description box. You can see what I get triggered. I get triggered over, over anachronistic material. So if you're going to take the Atlantis narrative of Plato and then just pick and choose what you want to believe, we have a problem with that. You know what? I need to go ahead and just show you. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you something. I can find it super fast. You guys need to see this chart. This is a chart. You need to see this chart. All right, so let's go with present, share screen, share screen. All right, entire screen. I know I'm talking out loud again. I'm going to share this entire screen. Now I'm going to go find this chart. All right, Cliff High, if you're listening, you need to see this. First of all, here are the elements of Plato's Atlantis narrative. It makes the 9,600 BC an impossible theory off by over 8,000 years. How do we know this? Because Atlantis had canal works. Atlantis was known for the domestication of horses. Atlantis had iron tools. Do you see these three right here? Do you see that right there? This is according to anthropology and archaeology. This is the scientifically accepted date today for the domestication of horses, the first iron tools, and the earliest canal works. Do you see 12,000 BC here? Do you see 9,600 BC here? No, you don't. Atlantis bridged all three of these. But not only that, if you're going to use Plato's narrative of Atlantis, Poseidon enslaved, uh, was enslaved to build Troy's walls. It's the oldest known wing horse relief. The oldest one. Poseidon is the subject matter of the Trojan War. Listen to this. Poseidon attacks Troy. 
sea peoples attack Egypt and Anatolia. This is all in the archaeological record. What is Poseidon in the ancient Greek myths, in the Achaean myths? It's a, it's the people of Atlantis. Atlantis was only a city in the in the in the country nation island of Poseidon. Poseidon unleashed the navies of the Sea Peoples Federation. This isn't Jason telling you this. This is all over the historical record. Every historian worth his medal knows about the Sea Peoples Federation and how they attacked at the exact dating of Atlantis. Yeah, Atlantis is destroyed right after they are defeated in a war. Atlantis is destroyed. Who is Atlantis fighting? They were fighting the Greeks. They were fighting the Greeks. But the Greeks came from somewhere else. Yeah, guys, it's all here. This chart shows, here it is, 340 BC, Eudoxus, Egyptian, Egyptians reckon a month is a year. You can't miss that. Look how big that is. Egyptians reckon a month is a year. Eudoxus of Nidus, 340. He lived in the days of Plato. Look at the bottom, 1271 BC, Egypt attacks the Philistines, a Sea People's Federation people. 1275, Battle of Kadesh, 1340, 9,000 moons, Atlanteans attack Athens. 1375 BC, look at the bottom, 1375 BC, Athens is founded. Why is this a big deal? Because in Plato's Atlantis narrative, Athens is the city that the Atlanteans are fighting against. But if Athens wasn't even founded till 1375, according to archaeologists and according to the Greek historians themselves, then 9,600 BC is bullshit. And there's no way to get around that. So here it is. This is all it, dude. This chart, this chart shows you all these different elements, all these different elements about Atlantis all show that the Atlantis story could have only happened in the 13th century BC. And this perfectly matches the 9,000 months because it only places the whole war and everything 700 years before Salon. It all works out very beautifully. All right. So let me get back down to my next chart we're going to share we're going to share some charts real quick okay here's the next chart this chart is sitchin science fiction chronology every single box you see here every box is 12,705 years do you have any idea how long that is let me show you how long it is look at the box at the very end that's where we're at right now. That little bitty line right there is where we're at. That little bitty line is the entire historical record. It is the capture flood, the Gihon flood, the Great Flood, the Ogygian flood, the entire written record of all civilizations, the whole Phoenix history, all of biblical chronology, everything we know about Sumer, Harappa, Ugarit, Byblos, Urartu, Egypt, everything fits right there in that little bitty area where, 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 my, where my cursor is. Right there. That little square. Well, I need to go back. Hold on. I need to go back. That little square right there is where everything fits. Everything in the known world, everything in the encyclopedias, the entire wealth of the world's knowledge is in that. But we have people like Cliff High now and Graham Hancock, and Zechariah Sitchin, who are promoting this. Look at this. Way back. Well, I tell you what, Graham Hancock's not on the Anunnaki. Cliff High evidently is, because he's, as we'll see, he's talking about all kinds of things happening 250,000 years ago. So here he is. Here, in this chronology here, I'll digress, because the host is a Sitchinite. The person that Jordan, that is interviewing uh, Cliff High believes in this model right here. This is the model he has accepted, that everything in our known reality fits in this little square. And yet, Zechariah Sitchin promotes that Anunnaki arrived 432,000 years before the flood. And yet I've shown the great flood would not be relevant in such a period of time because there were many floods. Hell, in the last 7,000 years, we've had the Capture Flood, the Gihon Flood, the Great Flood, the Ogygian flood. We had four major floods that affected the entire world. Yeah, four floods in the historical record, all documented by me right here in Archaics. 
So this model is wrong. And we know it's wrong because Barossus of Babylon made the same mistake that Plato did. He didn't understand the calendrics of the culture that was conveying the information. This isn't 432,000 years. It's 432,000 days, which is only 12 centuries. And this is what we find in many traditions, that the gods were here for 1,200 years before the Great Flood. Yeah, it's the Vedic system all over again. It's the Babylonian, Akkadian, and Sumerian system. It is the Mayan Bactan system. The Vedic, the Sumerian, Babylonian, and Mayan system all have ages of 144,000 days. 144,000 times three is 432,000 right here. That's three Mayan Bactans. That right there is the age of the Kali Yuga, 432,000 years, but it's actually days. What does Genesis tell you? In the evening and the morning of the first day, in the book of Genesis, the very first timekeeping system was day count system. And it kept that all the way through the entire Bible. It always says in the days of Noah, in the days of Jacob, in the days of Abraham, in the days of Nimrod, in the last days. Never, never talks about years. Ever. So keep that in mind, guys. Let's go. Let's look at this next one real quick. I got one more chart to show you, or maybe two. Here's the Graham Hancock chart. So look at this. 2023 just ended right here on the end. This is the entire historical record. 3500 BC recorded human history. Look at that. Sumer, Egypt, India, Maya, China, all right here. All fits right there. This is the beginning of all those. Fits right there. But according to Graham Hancock, look at this. Way back over here in 9,000. Well, he actually said 9,600 BC. Here it is, 9,600 BC. We have, we have Atlantis. And according to Graham Hancock, Athens, Greece, was also back here because that's who they were fighting. It's amazing that other people have not called Graham Hancock, Hancock out on this. Kind of makes you wonder. Kind of makes you wonder. But, uh, yeah, it's amazing. This, this doesn't even make sense. The actual Atlantis story is right here. See, people of Atlantis, every element of Plato's narrative becomes true if you listen to the other ancient authors who corrected Plato and said it wasn't 9,000 years. It was 9,000 moons. Once you, once you make that, here it is. This is the entire Atlantis story, Sea People's Federation. According to Cliff High, then this would have been when the aliens came down and vaporized an island to create an Antarctica right here. I don't buy that model, but that's what he's telling us. So just another chart just to show you. And this is the last chart. This is the last chart here, guys. This is a more definitive chart to show you better. Here's the very end is 2022. In the middle of the chart, the double lines, you see, this is the 35th century BC. According to anthropologists, historians, alternative uh, 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 yeah, archaeologists, alternative, alternative alt historians like myself, uh, this is when, even Zechariah Sinchin mentions the 34th century BC, this is when there is a sudden explosion of population, agriculture, urban development, cereals, domestication of animals. And it did, didn't just happen in Sumer. It happened everywhere at the exact same time. So this is right here. As soon as this is over, we have the development of Ubayid, Sumer, Harappa, Egypt, Mari, Ugarit, Rashamra, China, the Urum Baba Valley of South America, Maya, Olmec, Babylon, Jericho, Malta, Stonehenge, Newgrange, all these things appeared at the same time. Guess what also appeared? On my channel, I show you the calendrics. All these ancient calendrical systems, the Maya, the Olmec, the, the Kali Yuga, the ancient Egyptian long chronology, the Scorpion King, King chronology, the Hebrew Jubilee chronology, all these things started at the exact same time all during the reign of a, of a, a little-known individual named Enoch. All these ancient calendrical systems and many more that I did not even mention in this video, all these ancient calendars were using days, not years, and they all started in Enoch's reign, who was, according to the Book of Enoch, an astronomer, a chronologist, 
a historian and a prophet. Now, here it is, 5,500 years of known history. I got an arrow down here showing you where the Vikings were. Maps of ice-free Antarctica right here. Ice-free Antarctica right here, guys. So there was a vapor canopy in this area, and there was, 522 AD. I've, I've talked about that in my channel as well. Here it is, guys. Look at this. Whoa, way out here in the past. We've got Gobekli Tepe. Doesn't even make sense. It's too arbitrary. Then we have uh, the Younger Dryas Ice Age of the Uniformitarians, which is absolute BS. But we have it right here, 10,800 BC. We've got Hancock telling us that Atlantis was back here. I'm telling you now that Graham Hancock's a pretty smart guy, and he knows for a fact Atlantis was no such thing. So why the deception? Now, all right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen with that. Return to my chat, see where you guys are. Okay. <clears throat> cool. Shivites Jagnarth, bloody hell. I agree, man, bloody hell. I agree. Yeah, they all started all, yeah, guys, uh, somebody said it right. They all began as one single timekeeping system, but because of cataclysms, cultural revolutions, all kinds of things over, over centuries and centuries later, they became fragmented into different cultures' calendars. It's exactly what happened. Book of Mormon is false. Book of Mormon is absolutely false. All right, let's see. Book of Mormon started as a, started off as a book of fiction. That book of fiction disappeared, and they turned around and wrote it as history. All right, now let's get to that next clip. I lost IQ points on that one, guys. I'm sorry. I, I get real. I get triggered over the whole Atlantis shit because the accurate information is there. It's for everybody to see, and it, it, and it's incontrovertible. There is no one who will debate this if they look at that data set that I've published. There's no way to debate it because I, I'm citing all the other scholars and historians who also say the Atlantis was 13th century BC. And many of these books are in Graham Hancock's bibliographies. For yeah, the books that Graham Hancock has published, some of the books that I cite on Atlantis are in his bibliographies. The man knows the truth. So it begs the question why? But this video is not about him. We're going to get to him. This video is not about him. All right, let's see. So Cliff High has bought into the Graham Han Hancock version of history. At least respecting that. We're going to go to our next clip. Let's see, I'm going to present. Video file. The ancient Sumerian texts and... Even in the Bible, they reference the Garden of Eden, which I think when the Elohim got here, they set up a garden to start genetically engineering man. They, set, they set up many of them. Okay, yeah. the one that they're talking about, Eden, is actually in Armenia. Uh, we know where it is. It's description in the Bible with the mountains and the whole thing. We know where the Garden of Eden is. Now, garden is a mistranslated word. That's not in the Bible, okay? If you go back to the Old uh, Testament, it is Gans, G-A-N-S, or G-A-N-Z. And that is a bubble, mm -hmm. and it was a force field bubble. Wow. Okay, guys. Garden of Eden in Armenia is merely one location out of about two dozen that authors since the 1860s have been publishing. Ar and the only reason he, oh, Armenia is, is a popular one is because Mount Ararat is, lo is, is local. Noah's Ark was supposed to have landed on Mount Ararat. We don't know, guys. We don't know. But I do know that Garden, I don't know, I don't know where he got his translation from. I'm not going to say he's wrong. But I know that garden means walled enclosure. So now I will I, I will say this. If flat earthers are right and Antarctica is a wall of ice surrounding the continents, 
then the whole world would be the Garden of Eden, and the continents on the other side of Antarctica are a wider realm that, that we've been cut off from. If Cliff High is right and garden actually means bubble, I don't know, but if that's true, then the dome we call the sky would fit that description. The firmament of the ancients, the bubble, the dome of the sky. Thus, thus Eden is a realm where the garden was located and domed over to contain mankind. This is the flat earth cosmology all over again. So what I'm describing here using Cliff High's definition is that we, you know, I'm a simulationist. We live in a realm. I've seen no evidence of a globe. We live in a realm and the perimeters of that realm are defined by the collective unconscious. What we believe the world to be is the evidence that will be presented to us by the construct. The more people wake up to the fact that we do not live on a planet, but we live in a construct, the more that construct will show us more details about its construction, its phenomena, how it operates, how we interact with it. So what I'm saying is, is Cliff could be onto something here about the Garden of Eden. The Garden actually refers to a force field, a bubble, because if that's the case, then this actually supports the flat earth cosmology. I'm not a flat earther, but I'm also able to look objectively at two different two different series of, of, of data. If the world is a realm like I believe, then it goes on and on. But are we under a containment field? Yes. I'm, all, I'm absolutely convinced we are in a contained area right now. We have been quarantined and this area has been locked down from the rest of creation. I have said this on my channel many times. So Cliff could be onto something and the bubble he's referring to would be the whole dome of the sky. And the Garden of Eden is merely the habitable part that we find ourselves in now, which is quite beautiful. All the continents and oceans, all according to the flat earthers, completely encapsulated in a field that is impenetrable at this time. Just a theory. I don't know. I'm only going by Cliff's, and Cliff's definition of garden and Garden of Eden. So uh, it, it, to me, I found it really interesting. But uh, was there an Adam and Eve? Absolutely no. Absolutely not. You want to know about the, the story of Genesis and what the means and where a Adam, where the word Adam came from? Yeah, it's all in my video called The Real History of Adam and Eve and the Serpent. The link is in the description box for that video if you want to check it out. So let's go Let's go to the next one. Let's go see. I, 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 that was just something I wanted to point out. But yeah, me, people, the Tarim Basin Valley in China is now a desert. Some people believe that was Eden because of geographical monikers. But what if Eden is the whole place we are, we are now residing in? And we got it, we got it all wrong. And that the world is vast, but we're in this small contained area that we call Earth. So who knows? It's all it's all it's all very compelling. Well, let's go to the next section. I'm gonna present video file. I'm still talking out loud. <laughs> Do you think the Elohim brought the moon here? No. Okay. I, I think they took advantage of it being here. Um, the moon at the uh, most recent period of time that it could have arrived here is 250,000 years. Okay, so the Elohim have not been here 250,000 years. Uh, we see pre-lunar, uh, we see civilizations that talk about the time when the moon was not here, mm -hmm. and they talk about it in such a way that we can lift um, uh, astronomical alignments from there, which could be seen by them without the moon, but once the moon was here, they couldn't see them. And we can project from that that the earliest or the most recent period of time the moon could have been here, brought here, was 250,000 years ago. So any time from 250,000 years back to who knows how long, maybe a million years back, we just don't know. Just not, not possible to figure it out. The Elohim may indeed be on the moon now or in the moon, okay? They may think that they own the moon as they think they own Earth. 
because they're still screwing with us, right? They're still doing stuff. They're harvesting 8 million humans a year out of their human farm. So I'm of the opinion that these, these humans are going somewhere that is not available to us on the surface of this planet. So they're either going off planet or going to Antarctica or going into holes in the ground. I think they're probably being consumed uh, to some degree. Um, and, and so we're still being farmed and the Elohim is still here. It's a mouthful there. See if my chat's still flowing before I take off real quick. All right. All right, guys. I know my archaic veterans are sitting there screaming into their phones and tablets and laptops. <clears throat> the moon arrived 250,000 years ago at its most recent time. This makes this makes Cliff a uniformitarian. Does it, does it make him a bad guy? No, he's just bought into that uniformitarian bullshit. So now we have civilizations that talk of the time of before the moon appeared that left traditions that allow us to lift astronomical alignments. This is what he said just now in that clip, that we have preserved traditions from people living 250,000 years ago. First of all, I'm calling bullshit because there are no traditions anywhere in this world of any people that have lived that long. Whatever wiped out the megafauna would have wiped out humans as well. Whatever wiped out whole civilizations in 1687 BC and completely altered the traditions and the trajectory of cultures at that time called the Ogaijian deluge. Yeah, I'm not buying it. The world has been destroyed too many times. I'm a catastrophist. I have seen the evidence. It's in the historical record. A human traditions would not last 250,000 years. Do I need to show that chart again to you? How far back that is? It is, it is absolutely the epitome of ignorance to infer that anything in the human memory goes back that far. We can't even get accurate details about what happened in World War II. This is ridiculous. So, no, uh, you yeah, had to call bullshit on that. But even further, not only is Cliff High asking us to believe that there are traditions that exist from 250,000 years ago of a time before the moon appeared, but he's, but he's asking us to believe that those traditions are detailed enough for us to lift astronomical alignments that give us the dating for 250,000 years. I'm sorry, but Cliff High is a storyteller, and he will never be able to produce that data, ever. It is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. So um, I consider myself to be very well read. And until this date, I have only found a few sources about the pre-Selenites, the people who existed before the moon appeared. Now, I'm going to tell you now, only two sources in the world even talk about them. And this is, Vel okay, first of all, Emmanuel Velikovsky in the 1950s published uh, just a little bit, just a little bit, just a, little, a small mention, but he cited his source. So his, the source isn't Emmanuel Velikovsky. He got it from Hans Bellamy, 1901, 1902, 1919. He got it from Hans Bellamy. Hans Bellamy wrote some really interesting books. I have videos that cite Hans Bellamy. I even have videos on Hans Bellamy books. So Hans Bellamy isn't the source either. He got it from Hans Horberger. But there's an independent verification outside of Hans Horberger, who is a Viennese-Austrian uh, researcher. And that is Robert Graves, the undisputed authority on all things Greek mythology and tradition. Robert Graves in the Greek myths and in the White Goddess mentions the Preselenites, a culture of pre-Pelagian people who remember a time when the moon was not in the sky. But in that dating of Robert Graves, we're only looking at, we're only looking at as early as 4,000 BC for the pre-Pelagians. 
Nowhere is 4,000 BC close to 250,000 years ago. Come on, guys. You want to know? You want to? You want? You want to review the video? The link is in the description box. It's called the Capture Flood. Pre-Selenites and civilization ended when the moon first appeared in our sky. So, uh, also, I don't know where Cliff gets this information, but he says the Elohim to him, ancient aliens, the Elohim harvest are harvesting eight million humans a year for food. I don't know where he gets that data. I have no idea how to even confirm such a thing. Uh, yeah, I just, you know what? I'm going to leave that one to y'all. You guys can have that. Let's go to the next clip. I disagree with Greer 100%, and I think him something of an idiot in his mindset because he claims that all space aliens are good in spite of the many, many, as you point out, in all fucking different languages, uh, thousands of pages in our history were written about the abuse that humans took at the hands of the Elohim, having to sacrifice our children, cut the end off your dick, uh, go and attack somebody else and take their children to feed the Elohim. Or in the case of like in Mesoamerica, they had in one day, they, they sacrificed 10,000 special, specially bred children to the Elohim. The, the descriptions are that the bodies of these children pitched down from this pyramid were, were equal to about half the height of the pyramid when they set the, the entrails on fire to attract the Elohim to them. Let me uh, get this, remove this from studio. I got to talk out loud like this because I will accidentally hit the wrong deal and ter terminate the video or terminate me off the screen. I got to talk out loud when I'm going through these technical motions. So I, I, I do not have a high opinion of Dr. Stephen Greer. I may do a video on him. Um. So all aliens are good is just a psyop that can, I mean, if you're an intelligence apparatus, you're going to put multiple people out there that even have conflicting opinions as long as the con conflict still promotes what, what aliens, ancient aliens. So I'm not even going to buy into that shit at all. So <clears throat> Cliff says that thousands of pages, that's what he said. Thousands of pages of historical text tell of, of the Elohim subduing humanity. I can even give him a break and say just ancient aliens. Thousands of pages of historical text tell of the Elohim, ancient aliens, subduing humanity. But I'm going to tell you now, we don't have that at all. What we have is humans acting out. In the Old Testament, it's humans following what Moses said. And Moses always quoted Elohim or Yahweh. Actually, Yahweh, yeah. So, uh, this is what we had. We don't. We we have humans doing the work. We don't have the God showing up in the Old Testament doing things. We have humans doing the work when they're threatened by Moses that they're going to suffer this if they don't obey the dictates of Yahweh. This is what we have throughout the Old Testament. So it's a little different than what Cliff Cliff is saying. I don't know. I've read the Mayan Popol Vuh, the Volsunga Saga. I've read the Atrahasis epics. I don't remember anything about gods coming here doing anything. Like, like what he's talking about right here. So, uh, I mean, I just named a few, but there's so many. There's, I mean, we've read the the, the Karsag tablets and the Kudo Lagomar tablets. Um, I don't remember anything like that in Atrahasis, in the Era Epos, nothing. So, gods didn't come to subdue humanity. Um, I mean, ancient aliens didn't. We do have some some texts do talk about gods, like in like in uh, the Trojan War of Homer. Gods came down and fought on the battlefield, but there were almost in almost almost in every way there were concepts. So I don't know, like Poseidon, god of earthquakes and tidal waves. 
So I'm going to give it to Cliff. He can have that. I, I just don't, I don't, I don't buy into it that these thousands of pages of historical texts tell us the extraterrestrials. What he's probably referring to is that Eric Von Daniken and Zechariah Sitchin and ancient aliens claim these thousands of texts are referring to these things when it's not. I'm going to get on them. Don't, 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 don't worry about it, guys. They're coming. Well, yeah, well, they're, uh, my, my assault on ancient aliens is far from over. So yeah, it's, yeah, I'm just not buying into it. Now, in the Americas, Mr. High is claiming that 10,000 specially, he said specially bred children, yeah, sacrificed and that their dead bodies stacked up to the half the height of the pyramid. Okay, I know, I know this. Scholars have noted that the rumors of human sacrifice and Aztec pyramids and, and Inca throwing them into the, the sacrificial well and all that, the, this was Spanish, Genoan, and Portuguese propaganda against the local Native Americans to justify the theft of the gold, the rape of their women, and the killing of their leaders. This wasn't true. It's even admitted in the historical record. Scholars have found all kinds of references that it wasn't true. These stories were made up. Did the Aztecs sacrifice, human sacrifice? It was very, very rare. And it was ceremonial. And it often referred to the losers of the ball games. And that even that was ceremonial. All these Spanish traditions of the Inca throwing all these people in this well, and I, they found less than a dozen bodies for centuries of occupation at the temple complex. Less than a dozen bodies doesn't, doesn't at all comport with the Spanish propaganda that these people were involved in human sacrifice. No. They needed justifications for stealing all their wealth and gold, enslaving them, and converting them to Christianity. History is written by the victors, guys. That shit never happened. No pyramid was ever half buried in the carcasses of 10,000 specially bred children who were sacrificed. That I'm calling bullshit on. Now, <clears throat> all right, let's go to the next clip. Breaking out of that, okay, the reason we're breaking out of it, in my opinion, has to do with the Kali Yuga and getting more emanations from Galactic Center, and people are able to cogitate better. Um, but it, aside from that, it is factual that we've got this big awakening going on, and lots of people attribute it to um, uh, elevated energies and how they're feeling and thinking and so on. So my my premise is that the, the uh, Stockholm uh, Syndrome religions arose, uh, they were, we know that the Elohim created them deliberately. We know that the Elohim actually wanted to create religions. They actually wanted to be worshiped because it was a control mechanism. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'll talk about the Kali Yuga here in a little while. Um, he throws that out there like that's just Fact. I'm, we're going to get on to Kali Yuga. I'm, I'm going to leave it alone right now. But he mentioned emanations from the galactic center. Okay, this is far beyond the scope of, of my research. Uh, it sounds galactic federation to me. It sounds mystical to me, the woo-woo stuff. I don't, I don't know. Um, but I believe we live in a construct and the sky is, can, is entirely holographic. And apparently, I, I'm very. I understand that Cliff High believes that we live in a cosmos, and that he can actually travel to Mars and all these places, which may exist on the outside of this construct. But from within this construct, the sky is holographic. The moon is a hologram. There's nobody up there doing anything. So, uh, this is why the Russians never had a space program, a lunar program, to go to the moon. They already knew. They had already published the lunar data in the 1950s before NASA ever per perpetuated the Apollo 11 hoax. So, 
Yeah, the, the Russians had already published that the, that the moon was not what we thought it was, that it had to be very thin and fragile and hollow in order to even be there stuck in the sky in a dead orbit that just rolls around the world to where we can't even never see the dark side of the moon from the surface of the world. We'll never be able to see it because of the way it just rolls dead around the world. Half of it exposed to, to the world, the other half pointing out at, at deep space, never, never rotating so as to see what's on the backside of the moon. The, moon. the Russians reported the material that is entirely impossible. It completely defies the laws of physics. They even theorized that it may not even be there and that we're seeing something else. So, uh, but Cliff High can be forgiven for that because shoot, the majority of the world still believes that BS about space and that, that we can travel and that people have been walked on the moon. He still believes in all that. So that's, I mean, that's fine. That's fine. The, it, it was the greatest and most successful psyop in world history. So you can't fault people for still believing in that model. Still believing that they took a go-kart wrapped in aluminum foil and put it on the moon. Still believe that still. That's fine. I mean, it's a psyop, but it's really hard to convince people because they're always going to see what they want to see as opposed to what new data can reveal to them. So it's I'm not even worried about trying to convince him. Let him believe it. But uh, I do agree with him. I do agree with him. Yes to an awakening. There's a huge awakening happening. So if he's a part, if he's a part of that awakening, more power to him. More power to him. Let's get that next clip in. I think this is our last Christmas. Okay, I think that this is the last Christmas season that will happen in the United States as a national religious observance holiday um probably mm. you think it's that right? close huh it's it's that close the appearance of the ufos already that we're not being told about is causing militaries around the planet to have conniption fits some of which are breaking out where they're saying you know ufos are here and they're evil right and so you've seen the military people freaking out about that So, uh, I do not believe it's our last Christmas at all. I believe Christmas is going to come after all a period of chaos. Uh, 2024 is going to be really chaotic. I believe it's the breaking of the second seal. I believe that there's going to be all kinds of civil unrest and attacks against infrastructure in France, Germany, all across Europe, all across the UK, and in parts of the United States and Canada. I believe the tax of the infrastructure are entirely designed. This is the meaning of the, of the second seal. And just like COVID passed in 2020 and 2021, so will the lockdowns and all the security measures and the travel restrictions that will be imposed in 2024 in response to this widespread small arms guerrilla warfare that erupts everywhere. It's all by design. I've laid it out on my channel. Don't even want to talk about it anymore. It's the second seal. The seals were designed to wake people up. The signs of the times. We are on the elite calendar, which is the Greek Olympiad calendar. Every presidential election is every four years on the Greek Olympiad calendar. All the occult all the occult, very satanic Olympic ceremonies are on the Greek Olympiad calendar. It is the Olympic calendar. It goes back to ancient times. It is the timeline of the elite. The elite own the military, so I disagree with Cliff High. The military are not panicking over UFOs. It's all, it's all circuses, bread and circuses. The military are not worried about any of these things because they already know what they are. I have, I'm, you can go to the description, in the description box, you can go to my videos on, on UFOs, on EBEs, on the whole PSYOP about vectoring. It's all there. Military has been knowing about this since the 1940s and 50s. They're just playing ball because they are owned. Remember, guys, the archaics, in the archaics paradigm, I'm telling you, we're in the last days. And, there, and when it comes to politics and military and it comes to public faces that are, that are trusted by millions and millions of people, I'm telling you now, there are no more good guys. Get that shit out of your head. No, we are, in, we, are, we are culminating now into a massive spiritual war, and it starts with an info war. And we'll be, we're, most of us are going to be just fine until the breaking of the seventh seal, when the real true apocalypse and tribulation begins. Well, we got a good ways for that, guys. We got a real good way, at least 2044, before things get terribly bad. So let's move on. Let's move on. 
totally agree, totally disagree with Cliff on that. The public is not going to know about any true military engagements or involvements. Anything the public learns about the military, it's because the elite want you to know. It's as simple as that. Mainstream legacy media is owned by the elite. If the elite wants you to know something, they're going to make sure the news the news reports it. And they're also going to make sure that their puppets in alt media and their puppets in the truther community release that information and that fear programming as well. It's all by design, guys. If Believe me, if you don't know the players, you're not even in the game. So let's move on to the next clip. 13. We're on the 13th one. They created Adam um, out of a group that was known as the Essenes. Uh, they chose the Essenes for their own reason. The Essenes were these people that lived in southern Yemen. Um, the Essenes uh, are moved later, and they become the base for the Judeans, who the Jews call as their own people, and they're not. Okay, no Jew was, the word Jew doesn't show up in the Bible until in the 1600s, I think, or 1311, something like that. So there was no Jew in the word in the in the original Bible. They didn't exist. They were uh, Judeans. Anyway, though, so um, in that engineering, uh, they chose the Essenes because they had failed with all these other groups. The Nephilim was one of these kinds of failures. So they actually engineered, in my opinion, there's some debate about this in a serious way, the Elohim engineered and then abandoned the Khazarians. Okay, well, now we're gonna now we're gonna clarify. These are just anachronisms, all right. Anybody who was not well read, anybody who has not done the research, pulled a calculator out and done a lot of intense study on world chronology, they're subject to make these types these these kinds of mistakes. Now, in Cliff in Cliff's in Cliff's example here, it's particularly bad because it's not just bad dating he's really mixing whole anachronism he has an, several anachronisms in one statement and then he mixes them together let me explain elohim i gotta lean back for this one elohim created adam from a group called the essenes okay adam's supposed to be the first man so we're going back elohim arrived twelve thousand years ago in cliff's model so he puts adam at twelve thousand years at least adam is a Jewish version of a Babylonian word called Adamu. This is according to Near Eastern scholars like Albert T. Clay in 1923. Not me. Adamu was the actual word in Babylonian cuneiform text for mankind. When the Jews were in the Babylonian libraries, they saw this word over and over, and they invented that in the beginning, in the earliest cuneiform text, we have somebody called Adamu. So they changed it to Adam. They turned they turned it into a pronoun. And then Kava, description of a female, is now Kava, Eve. So a scholar who is who is link, who who is she's she's conversant in multiple languages, translates Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Her name is Akaria S. This is what she went by. It's a pseudonym. This is her publishing name. She's a scholar. She has now passed away, but she has written some fantastic material. Her name, you can, you can look her up, Akaria S. And she records that the Essenes were a doomsday cult. And these Essenes, they were waiting on the Phoenix cycle. The Essenes only date, guys, to 120 B.C. They disappeared in 31 B.C., which is a phoenix year. In my own videos, I show you 31 B.C. was the Battle of Actium, Civil War in Rome. Cleopatra died, but also the Americas are wiped out. 31 B.C. in our calendar is the final year on an on a Olmec date steal. The Olmecs vanished after that. The phoenix phenomenon happened, 31 B.C. The Essenes vanished, but they left their rights, Dead Sea Scrolls. So Cliff has really mixed all this up. That that it's a I don't know, I don't even know how to put it together. I'm really not sure how he put that together. But in Cliff's version, the Essenes existed in 12,000 12, years ago, and that's not true. 
the Essenes derived from the Jews. So the, I mean, I mean, excuse me, the Jews came from the people who were called Essenes. That's not true either. Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Cicero. We have references to Jews in the Roman texts of 2,000 years ago. In fact, there were many, many in Roman times who were complaining about Jews in their culture. So it's not something that just was recently invented and inserted into the biblical material. These people do have a history, and they do go back to Roman times at least. So Cliff jumps to the to the Nephilim, which is all which is immediately a reference to the Antediluvian period, the pre-flood world period. So in Cliff's mind, the the the, the flood was way back, ten thousand BC. So. This, this, again, is completely anachronistic, but the most troubling thing I heard was that the Elohim created and then abandoned the Khazarians. Okay, this statement is bizarre. It's bizarre in this context. You see, the Elohim, the Elohim created, okay, the Khazarians converted to Judaism in the 8th century 8th century A.D. of our calendar. This wasn't long ago, guys. 12 centuries ago, the Khazarians were forced to. They were a kingdom all by themselves, surrounded by the Muslim Turks and the Byzantines, Christian, the Christian, Christian Europeans. But among them were Jews who had been given, who were basically neutral. And they were given all kinds of rights, privileges, and immunities by the Muslims and the Christians. So what do you think when given an ultimatum to convert to Christianity, convert to Islam, or convert to Judaism, what do you think the Khazarians did? Because they saw the rights, privileges, and immunities that were already bestowed upon local Jews, they chose Judaism. The very fact that they were even given a choice infers that Jews existed at that time. So, oh... Uh, I don't know where Cliff is going with this, but I'm seeing a trend in the truther community to demonize the Khazarians as if the Khazarians are something different than the Jews of today. Now, by my own testimony, they are different. But when it comes to modern day culture, it seems that the Khazarians are being set up as fall guys. When the nature that they adopted goes back at least a thousand years earlier. Do you see what I'm saying here? If you don't, you may need to join Archaics TV to get a full understanding of what's being done here. When all of a sudden in the next year or so, all these people who are of Khazarian stock start falling in the media, getting locked up, all these different things that happen, getting exposed for different stuff. And yet, the true power behind them that used them as a buffer zone is untouched. So, this I'm starting to see a lot of drops like this. I don't know if this is his intent, but uh, yeah, the, the, the Khazarians merely adopted a culture that was already guilty of a whole lot of stuff going back to to Roman Greek times. So it is a culture that comes straight out of Babylon. Let's go to the next clip before I get in trouble. Elohim engineered and then abandoned the Khazarians. Okay, and they did another botched job on the Khazarians. So all humans have the number two uh, chromosome removed. All right, we have one less chromosome than any other primate. Yep. Okay, but that is not because of the Elohim. All right, so that existed prior to that. All humans have that, no matter, even if you go to uh, Homo capensis or any of these other forms of humans that existed. Uh, so if you go way back, we find that we all were altered to, to have that happen, to get this, uh, and I think it leads to intelligence. Nonetheless, anyway, the Elohim apparently tried to replace part of that or all of that chromosome with the Khazarians, and they failed. But the Khazarians know that they were genetically altered. They don't think of it as a failure. Hmm. 
<laughs> Kazarians are created by the Elohim aliens. And they know that they are genetically altered. Yeah, I've never seen a Kazarian Jew ever tell me any such thing or even put that in writing anywhere. I would like to know where Cliff gets this information from. We'll just go on to the next clip. Okay, so I'm not of the opinion that the rumors circulating out there now have any, any foundation whatsoever about a, an alien false flag invasion or attack. I think that's the, I think that rumor is the false flag. Okay. That's, so that's think, exactly what I think. It's like a psyop about a psyop. Correct. Correct. There yeah. will be an alien invasion and they don't want us to react to it. So Cliff, I to, to, to be, to be, to be, to be, uh, absolutely clear. Cliff high is promoting the idea that a real alien invasion is going to occur and that putting out the information that an alien invasion is, is actually a false flag is what the elite are really trying to do. So when the real aliens appear, people won't do anything because they'll look up at the sky and say it's all fake and all BS. So that's a really interesting take. He's promoting, now I believe we live in a construct. No aliens are going to appear. Everything is by human manufacture and it's all technologically induced. So uh, I'm, I have a problem with that. I think it's really, I think it's really interesting. It did, it did some real clever mental hurdles to come up with that scenario. But I don't believe an alien invasion is ever going to happen because I don't believe in aliens. I, I believe we live, we live in a construct. And now outside of the construct, all these things may be real. Extraterrestrial species, all di which are nothing but different avatars for different immo immortal souls in a different layer of the holography. I, I can't argue that. But inside this construct, I haven't seen any evidence of aliens or extraterrestrials. That's why I'm at war with the ancient aliens franchise. Yeah, I'm, I don't see any of that. I don't see evidence. I see you misinterpreting text. I see you completely using falsified imagery and all, all kinds of, of, of basically techno wizardry to get your points across, but there's no truth to any of it. So, yeah, I'm not talking about UFOs. I'm not, I'm not saying UFOs aren't real. I'm saying there's something else. I have a video in the description box, box called Vectoring that will allow you to understand the UFO phenomenon for what it is and not what it's pretended to be. Now, so I, yeah, I'm very interested. Let's go to the next clip. They fight for our species existence. Those humans that survive if we lose, we'll have their minds wiped, they won't know anything of any of this history, and they will be farmed for the next two or three or 4,000 years. I don't think that can actually occur because of what's going on in the galactic center relative to Earth and these emanations and how that affects humans over time based on my research in the ancient past documents, okay? Um, and I can get into that in great detail, but I don't think that can occur, but that won't stop them from trying. The goal was to, to wipe out six and a half uh, billion people. Okay, guys. Humans farmed and eaten. You guys already know, I, I started this video off telling you I'm not buying into that model. I don't buy into the matrix, humans, or batteries. Uh, you guys know that I promote the idea on my channel. And I back it up with my own personal life and how my, my own personal life has exploded with blessings and all kinds of things that I, that, I, that I call into contact with me. I bring these realities into my existence and I've, and I've taught the method and I show you guys that we are loved by an oversoul. And that oversoul has allowed us to be immersed within a medium that, that makes us to believe in all kinds of false things in order to develop our immortal personality. These things are not real. They're not real at all. 
and that we can even modify modify our reality. We can change the perimeters of our existence and bring things into contact with us that ordinarily would never occur unless we set those things in motion. And that the builder protocols of the construct itself will interface with us. Our informed field can build, as well as mental architects, we can build the very life that we want. And the informed field will project that as a reality, although it's not. I've told you guys in many, many, many presentations that this reality is the photo negative of a real reality somewhere else. And that means that through lies, we can build truths. This is why Jesus spoke in parables. Not one of those parables was true. None of those stories had actually happened. Therefore, they were a lie. And yet, they had, they preserve the greatest spiritual truths. Everything is the photo negative here. Of, or even, our, even our mathematics is actually an anti-arithmetic. Every bit of this is shown in archaics. I've given the demonstrations. It's all here. My archaics veterans know what I'm talking about. It's those of you new to the channel that haven't seen these videos and seen, seen these presentations on mathematical analysis and seen these cross calendrical parallels and calendrical isometrics and all these things that cannot be and yet they are. They're demonstrated. Yeah. This, this reality that Cliff High is promoting is fear programming. This is the epitome of dungeon programming. I'm not buying into it. I see no evidence of it whatsoever. Humans are not being farmed and eaten. We're just immortal souls in, in avatars that belong to the construct. They don't belong to us. But these avatars are how we move through this construct and do the things that we need to do. Intrinsically, though, we're immortal beings with an infinite amount of creative potential. You're here to harness that. You're here to hone it. You're here to enjoy it. You're here to learn and grow. Remember, we're not here to save the world. The world is nothing but a product of programming. So, which is ironic because Cliff High is a programmer. You would have thought he would have made these, these intellectual and these spiritual cognitive leaps to understand that none of this is real. You've bought into all the false programming of the construct. You bought into this BS, this fear programming. You're not a battery and you're not food. It's crazy. The whole thing's crazy. So anyway, no, the Galactic Center, he, he mentions the Galactic Center emanations again. I'm hearing Golden Dawn Society. I'm hearing Galactic Federation stuff here. And it, just like Elohim, he attaches the idea of Elohim to distance himself from the term ancient aliens. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. So, uh, the you know, Galactic, the Galactic Center emanations, according to Cliff's research on ancient documents. That's what he said. So maybe Cliff can do a video that cites these ancient documents that reveal to him that there are emanations coming from the galactic center that are going to save humans from being farmed by an alien race that will invade Earth. That's the video we need from Cliff. So I kind of need that video. Wipe out their intention was to wipe out 6.5 billion people. That was the goal. Listen. If you're going to promote an idea that we are food, why are you saying that they want to destroy their dinner before they eat it? I don't get it. It's a paradox here. They're either going to farm humans for food or they're going to wipe out 6.5 billion people that they cannot eat. You're promoting two different ideas and trying to mix them into the same paradigm and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So, yeah. Next, next clip. Where are we at? Number 17. We're on the 17th clip, guys. We're going to 24. And the last three are fast. 326 <laughs> years beyond the Kali year. You're going to get my conclusion. Getting a lot smarter. Everybody is. Kids, if we didn't have the vaccine and shit, would be more, born more smart. We're 326 years beyond the Kali Yuga. We're getting a lot smarter. Everybody is. Kids, if we didn't have the vaccine and shit, would be more born, more smart, more capable, more intelligent, you know, more robust than any kids in the previous generation. And it will continue that way as long as we're in this upward swing. So for perhaps for about another 11, about another 10,000 years.
Okay, so it's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting, but you know what? Kali Yuga, 326 years ago, Cliff High can be forgiven for that because he got it from somebody else. And let me tell you how they got it. You see, Vedic scholars and researchers have come across a quandary. They have a problem. They understand that some of these hyperinflated, like 4, 4 billion, 330, uh, 3, 320 million years of a different type of Yuga age, it's ridiculous. No history is recorded in great sums like that. So they understand the same thing that happened with the Sumerians, Babylonians, and Akkadians, the same thing that happened with the, with the Maya, the Quiche, the Olmecs, the Toltecs, the Aztecs, the exact same thing was the denominations didn't make sense. They were only counting days during the vapor canopy period. After the vapor canopy collapsed, they started mixing in years. Because years made sense to them now that the sun was visible and they had seasons. During the vapor canopy period, they didn't have seasons. So this is a this is this can be forgiven him, but it's understood. You see, many people who have studied the, the Vedas and studied the, the chronology of the Hindus, the Yuga system, they understand because different historical scholars have cited that a Yuga is only 1,200 years. And yet they couldn't reconcile that. How is a Yuga only 1,200 years? How is a yuga only 1,200 years? When we have in these old Brahmanic texts, in the Puranic texts, we have references to the Kali Yuga is 4, 432,000 years. How do you reconcile that? Well, it's very easy. It's the same way that I reconciled it in many videos explaining why Zechariah Sitchin was wrong. According to Sitchin, the Anunnaki arrived. 432,000 shards before the Great Flood. And we've dated the Great Flood easily at, 12, at 2239 BC by many different species of mathematical analysis. 12 centuries before that was 432,000 days. And it's exactly where we find in the historical record the appearance of Enoch. 3439 BC, the Gihon Flood. This is the 10 great shars, 120 years each. 120 times 10 is 12 centuries. The Vedic Hindu scholars also understood that in ancient times, the 1,200-year period was held as sacred. What they didn't understand is if you divide 432,000 years of the Kali Yuga age by, by 360, you get 12 centuries, 1,200 years. So when when Cliff High cites that the, what do you say, 326 years, 326 years ago, the Kali Yuga age ended. He can be forgiven for that because it, that's 1697 AD. 1697 AD is 12 centuries plus 12 centuries plus 12 centuries plus 12 centuries after the beginning of the Kali Yuga Hindu dating of 3103 BC. It's 4,800 years. He can be forgiven for that because it's an admixture of two different systems that were irreconcilable to, to the Hindu academics. I get that. I get. I understand the mistake. But the Kali Yuga ended with the Great Flood, just like, just like the 432,000 shars of the appearance of the gods before the flood is no different than the 432,000 days of the Kali Yuga that ended ended the age of the matriarchy. What was the Kali Yuga age? It has nothing to do with today. The Kali Yuga age was the age of the eight-armed goddess Kali, a pronoun derived from the word Kala, which means time. All these ancient calendrical systems are the same system. It's just cultural attachments that have been, been given to them that turn them into other things that we are now piecing together and we understand. The many in the last days are now being forged back into the one. It was one religion, one culture, one people, one language, one calendar in the vapor canopy period. So let's go with the... Uh, he can be forgiven. He can, he can be forgiven. that. But if you want to know more about that, 
there's a video I have linked in the description box. Uh, what is it? It's called, uh, what was that video? Oh, <clears throat> Correcting the Shar Chronology, a complete rewriting of the Anunnaki history. It's, it's one of my videos from a little while back where I go through all everything you need to know to understand how Zechariah Sitchin was wrong, how, how he can easily be corrected, and where we can find the academic scholarly data to prove this. And you can do it with a calculator yourself. All right. So let's go to the next clip. Oh, oh, I do want to address one thing. He did say uh, people were getting smarter. He said this in the clip that people are getting smarter. I'm going to tell you now, I don't believe that. We may be getting more knowledgeable, like in the book of Daniel, there's a prophecy that in the last days, knowledge shall be increased upon the circle of the earth. That's cool. I get that. But that doesn't mean people are getting smarter. Anyone who has spent a lot of time reading books from the 18th and the 19th century, this is the 1700s and the 1800s, will know that our vocabulary was more extensive then than it is today and that they knew how to use it. They were wordsmiths. I have spent hours and hours and hours reading from old books on my channel to demonstrate the caliber of intellect that people possessed a hundred years ago was far superior to what we have demonstrated today. Cliff High is a perfect example. So let's go with the uh, next clip. 18, 18th, number 18. Are historical documents that seem to suggest that there was two failed uh, guns that the Elohim set up or that the invading force set up. Okay, so let me let me back up a sec. Um, there's a lot of reasons to suspect that the invading force that hit humanity numbered in the about a quarter of a million uh, when they attacked us 12,000 years ago. Uh, but not all of those are necessarily Elohim. There's a really uh, muddied understanding of what's going on there. So the Elohim may have used slaves to attack us. Like they were the certainly Ajiji? involved. What's that? Like the Ajiji? Uh, no, more like... Um, Captured humans, okay. okay. Uh, Mind controlled captured humans, like they've got on the moon now. Where's that data at? Where can I read about that? Let's go to the next clip. Yeah, I don't have anything to say about that. Uh, 12,000 years ago, where'd you get the data that they used subhumans or other humans? Where, they, they attacked. Where do you get any of these particulars from? That just boggles my mind. We we have local Indian, Salish Indian, uh, um, oral traditions of Indians in the Pacific Northwest having to do uh battle with the people in Canada that were running this gods because they were dumping out uh the the mistakes that they made in their uh creation the the indian myths in north america is that the that the tribes filled the continent and at some point the space that the sky people come down and they the indians flee because the sky people are too powerful the sky people set up a big guns in mesoamerica america from which emerged the giants the Indians say that there, there, there were 10 tribes or 10 full tribes of giants that were released into North America. That would number about 3,000. Okay, I am not going to sit here and claim that Cliff Hyde did not read this. I don't know. I don't know where he got the information from. I don't know where. I know this on my. When it comes to research, you guys know that it's one of my mantras. If something is true, it can be seen from multiple different vantage points. So when I cite and I claim that ancient Native Americans believe something, I'm citing multiple different sources and cultures within, within that paradigm. I'm never going to isolate a particular of one group and then turn around and tell you it was the belief of all. No, we have to get, we have to verify things by multiplicity. 
This is the whole idea between comparative religion and comparative mythology. We want to see the common denominators between disparate peoples in their faiths. So I don't know where he got this information. I have no idea. I would be very interested in it, but then again, I've got videos on giants. I've got published book about giants. I don't. It's not. It's not a. It's not a subject matter that really fascinates me. But I, I've never seen anything about sky people came and released ten tribes of giants. And the and the, the particulars here about. That, I don't know where he got this information. There there may be a book that says these things. I do not know. Let's go to the next one. Twenty. Tucker Carlson has an authority that has told him some extremely disturbing stuff and he's barely able to contain himself and that he, because I think Tucker Carlson is basically a normie, a nice guy. He wants to have kids, grandkids, vacations, you know, yep. uh, turkey at Christmas, all of that kind of stuff, right? I don't think his mind is prepared to deal with what he knows. And it it's really it's that's what I think is the breaking in the voice and it's and it's fucking freaking him out. If you go to that interview and it's like at 37 minutes and 34 seconds in the Tim Cast interview, his voice breaks. And for the next uh, maybe five minutes, he does not really have control over it. Okay. Again. Again, I'm going to, I'm going to stress, uh, there, there's no way I can stress this to you guys. There are no good guys. They may want to be good. When they get at that level of legacy media, mainstream media, when they get to that level where millions are listening to them, they either get shut down, quarantined to where their, their community is all behind a paywall and they can't reach a whole lot of people or, or they sign that contract and they become a part of the problem. If you believe there are still good guys out there, you're probably a Trumper. Yeah, if you, you know, I, I don't even want to get into it, guys. Tucker Carlson may be a good guy, started that way, but he's, but I promise you, self preservation also governs his ag activities. And if he's all of a sudden shaking on that on on mainstream media, it's because Tucker Carlson's playing ball and he is doing exactly what his handlers are telling him to do. This is all that Cliff High would even fall for that. It blows my mind. It's, it's like, man, you people are not discerning anymore. You're not discerning what's being done. The entire world is a stage. Why are you putting your faith in one of the puppets? Oh, man, this is all the elite are very, very good at what they do. And they know that that when you hear, listen to me, guys, you can get on you can get on. YouTube right now and look up how many people are watching anytime CNN, CBS, ABC, BBC, anytime any one of these uh, programs they were, they were report they were reporting the uh, the the tsunamis the other day they were reporting the earthquake just yesterday they couldn't get 500 people live watching them how many people are watching right now I was looking at the ticker. I had over 2,500 people in the live chat. They're not dumb. They're not dumb. The elite know people have lost faith in mainstream media. So what do they do? They prop up people like Tucker Carlson. They prop up shows like Redacted. They, they pop up show. They pop up uh, different people who have gained the trust of the public because they were their alt views and all that. And then once they've reached a certain plateau, they scoop them in or they quarantine them. That's what happens, guys. Tucker Carlson, come on, man. He's a part of the elite, just like Russell Brand. There are no more good guys, guy. You got to get it out of your head. Your, your, your greatest ally here is the oversoul, not any avatar that's inside the construct with you. Yeah, that's not. Get it out, man. Psy all that is all that all the whole entire deal is to prop up the psyop about fearing the alien invasion. That's all that is. I'm trying to hear 20. Let's go to the next one. So it's not going to be a whistleblower when the military comes on out, stands up there in uniform and probably a space force uniform, um, and says, Hey guys, you know, we just shot this thing down. 
here's some of the gunk that we re retrieved out of the inside of it. It's not human. We got some real shit here and we got to start talking about this. We're getting close to that. You think so that's going to happen? Some kind of oh, massive yeah, event like that? Dis that's, that's how disclosure is going to happen. It's not going to be Biden or Trump or anybody saying there's UFOs and shit. There's no interest whatsoever, no gain to be had by any political entity anywhere on this planet announcing UFOs. They don't gain anything from it. And politicians only do what they gain from. The, the, what's going to happen is the military is going to force this because of the dire circumstances that we face. Uh, let me remove that from studio. All right, guys, <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a I'm gonna give you a real good summary. Sum this whole this whole uh, presentation up. But first, let's finish, let's finish these last couple of clips. You guys know that Cliff is a software engineer. He still believes. I mean, this guy still believes that space force has anything to do with space. Now, I am of the opinion. That Space Force is the internet space that's being policed, and that Space Force is an intelligence op organization and has nothing to do with sending rockets up into the atmosphere at all. We have seen no evidence that Space Force has anything to do with the sky. Now, the military is totally, is absolutely, totally controlled by the elite. There are no renegade hero generals or admirals. Get that out of your head. That's over with. The elite have long ago put contingencies in place basically to, to deal with any unforeseen rogue elements. The cowboy days are over with, guys. They're over with. We have entered the seven seals period. The first seal was broken in 2020. I didn't put the link to that video in there, but you can, you can find it on my channel. But yeah, it's all. The second seal gets broken next year. Yeah. Beware the games in France. That's all I got to tell you. So, yeah, it's a. Uh, they've already set, the elite have already set up all, they've got contingency plans set in place to deal with any unforeseen rogue elements. So, believe that. The establishment has a lot to gain for releasing UFO. I disagree with Cliff. The establishment has a lot to gain with this whole pantomime about ufos and extraterrestrial disclosures and all that because two for two reasons one it reinforces the idea that we're not in a construct and that we're on an actual world hurling through space at sixty-six thousand miles per hour tilted at 23.5 degrees obliquity going around a star 93 million miles away while that star is itself traveling at hundreds of thousands of miles per hour it reinforces this model that has been perpetuated by nasa NASA reinforces the model. Cliff High, this is the model that he's accepting. And that's cool because millions of other people have too. So it's, it's a, uh, but there's another reason why. <clears throat> there are many treaties, alliances, international laws, all these things don't mean anything if what's being done to people is being done by a, extraterrestrial race yeah it opens the door for violations that ordinarily could not occur and it opens the door for the violators to get away with it scot-free as long as you think it's aliens doing it yeah guys this goes deep this goes deeper than you think that's why that, that's why this video was necessary in many videos that will follow yeah so by Cliff's own admission, though, the Garden of Eden was a bubble where mankind was placed. So that's where we're at, guys. There's no doubt. We're in a construct. We're not, we're not in a cosmos. We're in a construct. Let's go to the next clip. He was a colonel in the, the 600-member uh, Supreme Council of the Elohim. Okay, he was not a general, any of that. He's a colonel. And he's a bloodthirsty drinking guy. And, and he, he was, because of this battle in the council, El Elyon, the head of the council, gave Yahweh the, the tribe of Jacob as his own herd. Okay. 
Wow. I'm speechless. I'm going to the next video. Generally, there's a battle for disclosure going on right now within the military industrial complex. Yes. Yeah. And they don't know what to disclose. They don't know how to do it. They they're thrashing and 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 probably running AI simulations all the hell and gone and not getting any clear uh, response because they a because they don't have the breadth of vision. Okay, they can't see the Elohim in the room. Okay, uh, there is no battle for disclosure. There is no internal you know, squabbles with the different militaries or within the, the United States or the whole entire, the whole entire military industrial complex is owned. It is controlled. They're not free thinkers. They're doing what they're told. And it's because, guys, it's not, it's not because a certain culture has imposed their will on everybody else. No, guys, since 1962, the United States has already did all the experimentation they needed to to conclude that we are inside of a closed environment. We are trapped inside of a construct and none of our technology has been able to penetrate those barriers. This is what has been revealed through all these different military operations that were going on in the Arctic and in the South Pacific and all the missiles that were shot up into the sky, nuclear atomic detonations, all the stuff that was going on in these different operations proved to the militaries of the world that we are in a construct and that the old cosmography of all these ancient civilizations that we were under a dome in a, in a completely closed off environment was absolutely real absolutely real. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Military is not arguing about how to disclose this stuff. No, all of this is a circus. It is all smoke and mirrors to get you to think that there is a controversy because every bit of this just allows you to fall victim to this, all this, all, all this, this media, legacy media BS and alt history, alt, alt channel BS that the alien invasion is coming. Yeah, it's all, it's all BS, guys. All right. The final clip. Then I'm going to give you my summary. All right. Dun, 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 dun. And you wouldn't believe the stuff that's happening on the moon. Oh, so somebody up there on the moon, if I had to characterize it, I would say that someone is preparing for a D-Day style invasion. Wow. <clears throat> it's interesting, guys. Someone is preparing a D-Day style invasion on the moon. Has anybody got footage of that? Has anybody shown pictures of the moon of this D-Day style invasion? What's going on on that hologram in the sky? I want to know. Inquiring minds want to know. I need to see that data because that's interesting. But truth be told, if I was to summarize this, this, this very unusual video. Cliff High promotes ancient aliens. Calling them Elohim does not separate him from that group. In Archaics, I have provided many data sets showing ancient aliens as a psyop, using evidence of technologically advanced human civilizations as their proofs that extraterrestrials have visited our world. It only takes us humans 200 years to go from horse and buggy to hadron collider we didn't need et's help at all see the link in the description box and in the pinned comment and uh you'll see all about the ancient alien psyops in my videos assault on ancient aliens archaics auto autopsy of a dead theory it's a pretty good video guys it was live also i have another video archaics versus ancient aliens and a third video that was very recent called Subterrestrial Vectoring, Alien Abduction Phenomenon, UAP, UFO, EBE, PSYOP. Cliff High promotes the falsified hundreds of thousands of years interpretation of surviving human traditions of the Sumerian Shar system of Zechariah Sitchin for Anunnaki dating. It's the same thing he's promoting. In Archaics is the proof, Shars were days, 
not years. The links are below in the description box. Cliff High promotes Graham Hancock's fantasy version of history concerning Atlantis as 9,600 B.C. or earlier, as well as Graham Hancock's erroneous information about Gobekli Tepe. Man, did I say it right? Archaics, archaics, you see the evidence, abundant proof in the links below that Graham Hancock is absolutely wrong about both Atlantis and that, that site I can't pronounce in Turkey. The links are below. Cliff High promotes the occult traditions of the Golden Dawn Society, Madame Blavatsky, and mystics that claim the world was destroyed 12,000 years ago, a claim regurgitated in amateur research texts and recently by many others like Douglas Vogt and Ben Davidson of Suspicious Observers. NASA data is being used to promote this falsified version of a 12,000-year cycle as well. Yeah, guys, that 12,000-year cycle appeared in the, in the 1800s, and the, the origin is a mistranslation of ancient calendrical data, which I will show. I will show it. It's very interesting, guys. It's very interesting. The links are below. But Cliff High may be a good guy. I, I don't doubt that at all. May have good intentions. May have a, he may be an entertaining person to listen to, but he is no historian. He has little concept of sequential events. He is certainly not a chronologist. In my opinion, Mr. High's research ethics are subpar, and that most of what he is promoting is in the realm of adult fantasy and its fear-based programming. I'm not with it. I'm not with it at all. Yeah, the, fu the, future, the future can be real bright. I'm, not, I'm just not buying into it. I do not buy into the aliens are going to have me for lunch, PSYOP, and you don't need to buy into that BS either. There is no evidence of this outside a growing number of Hollywood and Netflix productions. Aliens are not going to stop Christmas. I'm not buying into it. Now, for those, those who are interested in Mr. High's presentations, I'm going to provide the link to his channel in the description box with all my links to my free downloads and my videos and all that. Um, it's just crazy, guys. This was the first episode of Archaic's Iconoclast. It's the most sanitized one, too, because I do have a modicum of respect for, for Mr. High. I believe he's trying to tell people the truth as he knows it. But the next presentations, no, they will be against individuals I believe are deliberately promoting false information. Now, I will say this. That sums up my, my video here. But I will tell you this. I've seen UFOs. Two or three times in my life. Twice with Dawn. I'm not saying they're UFO vehicles. I'm not saying they have occupants. or unidentified flying objects. I've seen them, guys. Oh, saw one in the backyard the other night. It really, really messed Dawn up, but I saw it with multiple witnesses. Seven or eight of us saw it. It's very unusual. Large, glowing. Didn't look like a vehicle to me, but it looked like a glowing veil. It was large. And it changed direction. Then it disappeared into a cloud after we started talking about it loudly. I don't know, guys. It's very interesting, but it did happen to me. I do not refute the phenomena. I refute the interpretation. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. This is my presentation. It's already gone way longer than most of my videos. Well, the average videos. So I'm going to sign out. And I love you guys. And I'm going to hit that badass outro. And I will see you guys later. Epic presentations are on the way.